This podcast is brought to you by the Islamic Center and NYU. For more information, visit our website at www.icnyu.org. So, bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala seyyidina wa sallillah, wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa man wala. It's nice to see everybody. Alhamdulillah, hope everyone's doing great. Allahu Akbar. Um, we've been reading through this text in Hajj al-Abidin of Imam al-Ghazari, which really centers us around, you know, living a life of devotion, living a life of purpose, a noble purpose, which is worship. And he said that he identifies some of the obstacles to that process. That's really the purpose of this book. And we stopped at the section on knowledge. We're at the very end of this section. And, you know, knowledge is divided really people when it comes to religious knowledge into three categories. First are those people who don't know, but act in a passionate way. You know, so like, I'm very excited. I have a lot of passion, but I don't really know. I remember years ago I was sitting in a masjid and this man came to me and he was like, you know, your people, whoever my people are, my people are in a house on fire. And it's my job to go and rescue them. Just run in the house. And then there was an a elderly gentleman who said, yeah, but every fireman has like the blueprints to the house. It was like run into a house. So that kind of is the danger of like passion without thought. And Mutanabbi, He's a great uh, poet from the Abbasi period. He says, Which means to think before you're brave is to be brave twice. And not just like act impulsively. So the first are people who may be overcome with passion, which is a good thing, right? It's nothing wrong with being passionate. Alhamdulillah, it's important. But like, that's not what ultimately should drive the strategy. So the idea here is knowledge, I mean, passion without knowledge. We see this in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, hadith led by Tirmidhi when his, after he, you know, been in Medina for some time. And some people ask, say to Aisha, how, how is the Prophet at home? So she said like this, how he is at home. And then they said, like, you know, I'm, I'm going to fast for the rest of my life. Another one said, like, I'm never going to sleep. I'm going to pray to Hajjad every night. Third one said, I'm never going to marry. And then when the Prophet came home, she informed him of these people because she knew this was a problem. So he, he went to them, uh, peace be upon him. And he said to them, like, I sleep, you know, like, I sleep, I eat food. I fast, I don't fast, I marry. In other words, like balance, right? And you find the uh, hadith in Bukhari where the Sahaba said, Can Like the Prophet used to order us to do what we could do. We got angry. We want to do more. We want to do more than that. And he's like, No, 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 just do what you can do. So sometimes, like, passion can take us to be too harsh, too difficult, right? And we think, like, I'm serious today when I said, if you need to go study, go study. Like, I'm, I want to see you do well in school. I'm a parent. I'm a father. So, I, you know, I, I didn't mean that in a, like, a condescending way. I mean, it sincerely. There's a time for this and a time for that. The second approach to knowledge are people who know but don't act on what they know. So they know, but for whatever reason, they don't act on what they know. Then the third are those people who know and they do their best. They're not perfect, but they do their best to implement what they know. And this is what we actually ask for in Surah Al Fatiha. Those who you favored are those who know and act on what they know. Those who believe and act. The second, al-maghdubi alayhim, those who know but don't act on what they know. 
a third of Dalim, those who are passionate, but they don't have any foundational knowledge. You, know? you can apply this to any sort of aspect of life. So Imam Al-Ghazali finishes this section and he says something really nice. And we talked about it briefly, but then like we started to run out of time. And he says, if you're to act on these things that he talked about earlier, like those three foundational knowledges, faith, practice, and to soul, right? Character. Review those. Think about them. That's why on Thursday, that's what we're teaching you, actually, are those foundational points that he talked about here. So he says, if you act on these three, if you continue in your life, learn about these three things, right? As, as things come to you. Because he talked about there's foundational learning, and then there's like things that involve our experiences. So like there are certain things I need to learn, like doctrine. That's true. But then also as my life changes and I go through different circumstances, there will be certain things that come to me that I need to learn about or ask about, read about research or whatever. So he says in the area of these three things, what we call usul al which is iman, fiqh, and tazkiyat al nafs. You and I dedicate our lives to that. We just try to implement it as best as we can. He says something so nice, mashallah. He says, rahimahullah ta'ala, falaqad addayta fardallahi ta'ala alayk. Then you have completed what Allah has obligated you to do. And, of course, the topic of the text, الَّذِي تَعَبَّدَكَ فِي بَابِ الْعِلْمِ That it's these issues of knowledge that Allah has obligated you to worship with. And that's how we should think about this. And sometimes it's hard in the Western academic kind of environment, but also with the Muslim community. The purpose of learning isn't really to worship, man. But that's the purpose. So he's saying, like, if you do that within your ability, within your space, with your resources, don't, he talked earlier about, like, don't make it too hard. You don't have to learn everything. He talked about that. It's not, it's not something you have to worry about. You have to learn what. This is actually a great point I didn't mention. He says, عندما تظن أو تسأل أنا من أهل ناري أو أنا من أهل جني like if you reach a point in your life where you're like, if I do this, am I going to heaven or hell? If I do this, am I pleasing Allah or bringing about Allah's potential anger? Then I should learn. That's how we centers it. It's not about likes on Instagram, followers. It's not about speaking at conferences. It's about how you treat people. How I treat people. Who do you think the best person is to evaluate me? Even, even if I was still in the imam, who would be the best person to evaluate? The guys in the masjid? Would that, would that really be the best person? Like, if I'm really serious about that career, right, who's the first person I should go to for quality control advice? It's my wife. That's, that's, that's who sees me, everything I do. Or my kids. Because it's easy, performance-based religion now, just like performance-based society, that's easy. Salaamu Alaikum Sidi, Allahumma Salli Allah, Sayyidina, MashaAllah, brother, I got the shea butter, I'm beaming, I'm glowing. That's easy. So when the Prophet dies, Alayhi Salatu Salaam, Wa Huwa Hayun Fi Qabri, the people went to say to Aisha, what did they ask her? How is he in his house? Because they already know, they know that, how he is. People. He used to serve us. Allah, what an answer, man. So Sayyidina Imam al-Ghazari says, if you do that, khalas. And that takes us now to the second obstacle. Congratulations. Alhamdulillah. We finished the first. And today we're going to talk about seven issues. If we have time. But... Before we do it, the second obstacle is repentance. Why? Because the more I learn, today we're talking, just putting the notes together. It's like you and I look at this wall, right? What do you see? I see a wall. But if you brought a painter in, the painter would give you a very different description of what you're looking for. 
could tell you, or she could tell you, the type of paint, how long it's going to last, what kind of brush was used, how many layers of paint are on the wall. So the more we know, the more we, we become aware. We become aware of particulars. It's like when you go, when you move to New York, right? Or you go to university, you have this general kind of imagination. And then as you meet people, as you engage people, you begin to edit it. Like the grammarly of life right? begins to like change how you see things. So here, what the imam does actually is really nice because this happens to a lot of people. They suddenly become very religious and they often go way too fast. And then that rush, they become like really, really like angry and they start to see like everything in a bad way. But there are two challenges of religious knowledge. The first is the challenge of being overly laxed. Like more, it's not that big of a deal. Oh, I thought it was such a big deal, you know? I thought like, I did, didn't do this, like I'll go to hell. And I found like, like 17 different opinions on this issue. <laughs> so it becomes like, sort of like, oh, okay. So I may become too relaxed. Or the opposite. I become too cynical to the point that it leads to like depression and anger, man. So there's no hope. There's no way. Allah will never forgive me. I've done so much evil. You know, I have so much in my past. It's over. I was raised, wasn't raised right. I had this experience, this experience. You know, I never had these opportunities. Shaitan will just pile it for. So at that moment, a person finds himself because now they can see the type of pain it is and they know what the brushes were and they know how long this, it's been since it's been painted. Now they look at religion that way and they have the danger of falling into like being overly laxed. Or in the more common is to find people that are overly harsh on themselves. And that pushes them out. So that takes us to the next tool for this journey of living a life of devotion is toba, is repentance. SubhanAllah. Because if I'm overly like relaxed, then I can rectify this by repenting. Oh Allah, you know, I, I made some mistakes, I slipped, I failed. Forgive me, I'm, I really want to do better. The second is, if I'm falling into despair, لا تقنتم رحمة الله Allah says, don't give up on my mercy. Wahshi is the murderer of Hamza. Killed the Prophet's uncle. We all saw the messenger. We're all, like, basically, we're Muslim kids. You had to see the messenger like at least 400,000 times. My brother in law like, has it numerous. It's crazy. But subhanAllah, uh, Washi, he murdered the Prophet's uncle. And he actually hid in Mecca. The Prophet is in Medina. Washi hides in Mecca. Because there are the Prophet's enemies also. So he has little protection. And he sends a message to the Prophet Sallallahu that I want to embrace Islam. What kind of character did the Prophet have? I want to embrace Islam. But I killed your uncle, man. And your Quran says, Wala taqutulu nafsa lati haramallahu illa bil haq. The Quran says that a person cannot kill someone unjustly. Then also the Quran says, Walladhina la yada'una ma'allahi ilahan af. Right? Those who don't call on Allah. Other than Allah, they don't commit shirk, they don't kill, they don't commit zina. He said, I did all three. So he thought that repentance was conditioned. I remember when I wanted to become Muslim, I was like, oh man, I can't become Muslim. I still like to do this, I still like to do that. I gotta stop all this stuff, right? I'm creating conditions, which is good, good in a balanced way. Then the Prophet writes back to me, 
except for those who repent and do good. Those you Allah will take their evil and turn it to good. Then he wrote back and he said, I don't know if I can do Amr al-Salihat. Like, I, I, it is very vulnerable. It's like, I don't know if I can do that. Like, I, I believe, but I don't know. I got, I got problems. Then he wrote back to him. He had someone dictate. لا تقنوتن رحمت الله إن الله يغفر ذنوب الجميع. So to Zuma, like do not despair of Allah's mercy. And he said, الآن 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 غير مشترط. Like now it's not conditioned. فأسلم. سبحان الله. And he became Muslim. Why she became Muslim? That's crazy. But the point is, Prophet Salam is is strategically open doors for people. There's entry points to repentance. So why is this point important that Imam Ghazali is going to bring up is because on this journey, we may find ourselves in one of those extremes, extreme of being overly lax and irresponsible or despondent and overcome by grief. So how do we fix all that? Allah. Quran says, run to Allah. So the first question we addressed is like, the kind of seamless way he takes us to the, the next step on the journey. And, 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 and we have to say again, that it doesn't mean this is gonna be linear. It doesn't mean also like it's only gonna happen once. These are gonna be permanent tools in my toolkit for my life that I can use and employ at different times. It's how we wanna look at this text. The second thing that we're gonna talk about is why repentance is important. There's two issues he's gonna mention. I don't know if we mailed out the notes yet, but we take notes every day myself, mashallah, we send it to you guys so you have like kind of a, a outline you can follow. Um, and this is where we're gonna stop. The, the third thing that we'll talk about is what is repentance? What is it? And then next week we'll finish up um, some of the things that you know, we're gonna stop today. Because it's time. May Allah bless you in all your exams. Make it easy for you. Inshallah. But just remember there's a greater exam waiting for us all. So this ex these exams are sort of just reminders of a greater exam. May Allah make it easy for all of us. Inshallah. So Imam al Ghazari. Going to start on this journey. He said, After this, now I implore you, may Allah guide you, he says, to repentance. We find repentance used a lot in the Quran in really beautiful ways. Allah says, and repent to all of you believers. Notice the verse doesn't say sinners. It says believers. So that you'll be successful. So to know. But also in the Quran Allah says. <laughs> Allah says those in Shota Buruj. Those who kill the believing men and women. Allah says those in Shota Buruj. Those who kill the believing men and women. Thumma lam yatubu. And fail to repent. Then they go to hell. So what if they repent sincerely? What's inferred? So we find that repentance is used in the Quran not only for people that struggle, people that may have fallen into sin, for also the righteous people. Allah says, "In Allah you hibbu tawabin, wa you hibbu mutatahin." Allah loves the tawab. He doesn't say tawab. Tawab is someone who repents once in a while. Tawab is the one who repents all the time. This is the form is called like a hyperbolic form. Like the hadith, you see it's mistranslated all the time. If you're a woman, you remember this. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Then say Allah cursed women who visit graves. A lot of people ask me this. Does it mean I can't go to the graveyard? Tell them who taught us the dua to go to the graveyard, say to Aisha. Why would the Prophet teach her that dua? She could go to the graveyard. And the hadith of the woman where the Prophet saw her in the grave and she was weeping, he said, and she said, you don't know what I've been through. 
And she came, I'm so sorry, I didn't know it was you. Did the prophet tell her, you can never go back to the graveyard. Why were you in the graveyard? No, he said patience is in the first instance. If it was haram for her to go in the graveyard, we have an axiom at Usul of Fiqh. تَأَخْرُ الْبَيَانِ بِوُجُودِ الْحَاجَةِ مُحَالَ عَلَى رَسُولِ اللَّهِ that if there is a need, it is impossible for us to believe the Prophet would not tell someone something that's haram. That's impossible. But then also the language of this mess translated hadith, he doesn't say that Allah cursed the women who go to the graves. He used the same form as tawabin, fu'al, which means what? Those who what? Always in the graveyard. Because in the prime of time of the Prophet, he used to pay women to go and weep and cry and this is what that, so now we understand the hadith. That's what we say, like an Arabia miftah al khair. And be careful sometimes you come across translations and you're like, oh man, don't ask. Can I see the Arabic? Who translated it? It's not rude. That the same rigor that people are censoring you, you have the right to discover their sources. Hmm. That means that they're constantly repenting. So that means they're constantly what? Constantly sinning. SubhanAllah. Doesn't mean you go out now and go, you know what I'm saying? but it means they see in themselves the need to turn back to Allah. So they're very introspective. They're very mature people. None. The Shaykh, he says, فَعَلَيْكَ بِتَوْبَةِ وَذَارِكَ لِذَارِكَ لِأَمْرَيْنِ Imam Al-Ghazali, Abu Hamid, he says, you know, you should, you got to take this tool with you wherever you go. The repentance of Tawbah for two reasons. The first, لِيَحْسُولَ لَكَ تَوْفِيقُ الطَّاعَةِ The first is that the more you repent, right, the more you and I become right for guidance. The more that we seek Allah's forgiveness, our sins are obliterated, alhamdulillah, our souls are dilated, alhamdulillah. So at that moment, our sight, right, our spiritual sight becomes clear, to feet from Allah. Because, like you know, the filth of sin. It's going to bring about evil behavior. So I'm like cleaning it up. I'm removing it, spring clean. And it brings about the punishment of khidlan. And the weight, the chains of sin will prevent you from walking to Allah's obedience. This is of course like metaphor. And, and, and racing to his service because I'm heavy with sin. Because the weight of sin is going to keep us from the lightness, the agility, I like this word, needed to worship, to do good. When the shalt fi ta'at and to be active in obedience. Then he talks about how continually falling into sin, and we're going to talk about sin in the future. What is sin? Creates misguidance in the heart. وَقَصْوَ and harshness. وَلَا خُلُصَ فِيهَا وَلَا صَفَاوَ And there's no purity in the heart. Right? It takes it away from the state of purity. وَلَا and there's no like taste for worship, sweetness and pleasure. Wala halawa or sweetness. And then he moves on to the second reason. And he says, Watani min al amri inama tazumka tobali takbala minka ibaratak. Li tuk balu or li tuk bala minka ta atuk. That toba is key for your Acts of obedience to be accepted. And he gives a very interesting example. He says, if you owe someone a debt, right? So let's say I owe Omar, you know, two Bitcoin lines or something. And they're like, hey, man, I got you some shoes. 
Like I try to give him a gift. He's not going to be happy. So he's saying here, like, if I'm steeped in sin, but then I'm not, and I'm not addressing that sin, and I'm not repenting for that sin, that's like the person trying to give the creditor a gift. But I need to take care of my problems first. That also leads to a second issue, and that is an awla yet, right? Like having priorities. Oftentimes we see people in Islamic work, they're not focused on themselves. So the priority becomes their sphere of concern, not the sphere of influence. But he says, Rahimuhullah ta'ala, that, that in that situation, the creditor is not going to accept your gift. And that also applies to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If I have ma'asi, if I'm steeped in like disobedience and sin, and I'm not addressing that or repenting for it, and I'm trying to do other things. He said this is the same scenario. That takes us to the last thing that we're going to discuss briefly. And he says, The Quran says very nicely in Surah Tahrim, Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu, tubu ila Allahi tawbatan nasuha. O believers, turn to Allah. The word nasaha means to never return. To never return back. So like a clean break, if possible. There's a different qira'a, tawbatan nu, nusuha. Same, the same meaning. So he says, maybe you're going to ask me, like, what does that mean? Because it kind of sounds like it's really intense, you know? So, ma'ana, tawbah, al nasuha wa ma hadduha, wa ma yanbaghi lil abdi an yaf'aruhu, hatta yakhruja min al dhunubi kulliha. He says, like, you're going to ask me, what does this mean? What does it mean in the Quran to break away, like, to really turn and repent to Allah? The word tawbah in Arabic, by the way, Means to turn. But tip to Anki was a turned away from Wasa. That's tip to. So tell me to turn. And so how do I do like a total 180, if you will? That's what this person is asking. So Sayyidina Imam uh Rahimuhullah Ta'ara Fa Aqur wa Amma Tawbah to He says as for uh, a Tawbah then it is masai al qalb. It's what drives the heart. And he says some of the ulama they defined it as tanzih al qalbi an right? To distance the heart, to transcend beyond sin. But then he mentions a definition which we're going to talk about briefly, and then I'm going to let y'all go, inshallah. And if you have exams next week, let me know. No problem. No problem problem you know keeping things brief we're not doing it and that is that toba is tarku ikhtiyari dhambin sabaqa mithluhu anhu manzilan la suratan many of the prints that are out there they don't have the word la it says manzilan suratan doesn't make any sense if you think about it now manzilan la suratan وَتَعْظِيمًا لِلَّهِ تَعَالَى وَحَضَرًا مِنْ سَخَطِهِ Allah is like a really cool, cool definition, man. It brings you a lot, of, a lot of hope, you know? So he says, the first thing is تَرْكُ إِخْتِيَارِ ذَنْبٍ The first is that, the first component of tawbah, repentance, is that I choose to leave sin. So I... From my own utility, my own will that Allah has given me, I choose to stop this. I'm not being compulsed. I'm not being forced. Uh, There's no compulsion in religion. Right? So, so I have chosen to stop. It's a nice thing, he says. Right? That implies like, I'm responsible for myself, man. 
Sometimes our parents, they say to us, my mother was Christian, but she said, you're going to put me in hell. I was like, well, you're going to put me in hell. I was like, no, I'm not. She, no, you know, you turned away from Jesus Christ. I was like, that's between you and Jesus. She's like, what do you mean? I was like, I was like in, in Islam, everybody's responsible for themselves. But then I read Muslim kids are like, their parents are like, you can put me in hell. You know, I'm going to be punished in the grave because you went to this university instead of the one we wanted you to, and you're not becoming an engineer. It's like, hold, what? hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> hell? <laughs> right, let, let's back that, that, that anxiety train up a little bit. Right? No. We are responsible for ourselves. Because if somebody is forced into sin, why would there be no total? Because no compulsion. Allah's Kareem. Process of Rufia and Umati Masukrihu Ali. My community is forgiven for what they're forced to do. Allah says in the Quran, no soul can bury the burden, bury the carry the burden of another soul. So it could be like a metaphor, like you know, you're like you're putting me in purgatory. Right? I get it. Yeah, hell on earth. But then say it, right? But when we tell and, and also it needs to be, you know, and I say this as a parent, it needs to be something that warrants that kind of intensity, right? So no no by no means am I trying to undermine. But I have never seen this work positively. Never. So it creates a lot of damage. So metaphor, and, and if we understand it's a metaphor, then that's we know our parents are just tripping and whatever. It's not. But if they're like, you, you're putting me in hell because of how you live your life or the choices you made. And it's a hard conversation you have to have with parents when their kids are adult, man. What can you do? What can you do? Man, once they're adults, man, that's between them and Allah. You try to motivate, right? You can put some economic embargoes. <laughs> you, can, right? you can do certain things, but like ultimately, sometimes it's hard to accept those things. And you hope that you parent your kids in a way that you give them so many kind of universals that they make the right decisions. I told my son, fail, but fail right. Right? You can make mistakes, man, but don't make dumb mistakes. Now make a mistake that you learn from, hopefully, and I'm there to help you. But I'm not, you know, I'm not a great parent, but I'm not telling like you're gonna put me in hell. Nah, buddy. Nah. No. And that, that's, that's sometimes we use that's not a good thing. And sometimes spouses do this. Right. Where it's like, you know, if you don't do what I say, we're all going to hell. No, you're not. Hell's between you and Allah. Hell's between you and Allah. When he says, That means that I have not been forced into sin, which is one thing. I have also not been forced to repent. But I have chosen from my own volition to turn away from this. I love this because where does it put the onus of the whole thing man? on us? It says, what does that mean? For something that has happened in the past, I cannot repent for something that's going to happen. Like, you know, oh Allah, tomorrow I'm going to steal some Nahari from the local restaurant. Please forgive me. <laughs> right? There's no like predetermined sinning. Because to ask, and he says something so nice, to ask to be protected from sin before you follow, fall, or I follow into it, is tough. That's a mutak. Allah protect me, help me, sustain me, shield me from this. That's why it's taqwa. Taqwa is a shield. The word means a shield. I got a brother, I, I think I told you guys one time, in Ramadan, he's like, I ask Allah to keep me from heroin. He's like, I have, he's like, Am I fast broke? If I shoot heroin? Right, that's, that's just, like, he's trying. You know what I mean? So we're not talking about someone who's playing with the deed. Someone's like, oh, Allah, please, like, he's like, please help me. Sustain me. I don't trust myself. You know? 
and they mean it, right? That's 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 taqwa. Even if they fall into it, but they're sincere, they're still taqwa. It's very different than someone that's like, yeah, I'm gonna steal the Mahari tomorrow. Oh, no. That's like that's how it's villa. Taqi the ayati like who's one? The yala abidi. They're like playing with the religion. ما سبق سبق مثله عنه منزلا لا صورة. Why does he say that? So nice. Because maybe somebody in their life they did some things, and then years later they remember. It's like when they were old, they're old, so now they don't even have the power to do the evil that they used to do. So maybe that person feels disheartened, like man, now I want to repent, but. Maybe I'm not sincere because, like, I don't even have the ability to really do what I use. I don't. I can't steal an already. I can't run. Whatever. Right? Hypothetical situation. So does that still count? That's why he says this. Can it be manzilan la suratan and la haqiqatan? But he's saying like, if it happens, no matter when it happens, whether it's happening now or whether you don't have the ability to do it anymore or whatever. If you repent, it's okay. Sabaqa mithluhu manjilan la surat. Or perhaps I can repent for other things. Like I can say, like, I may be older, but I can still backbite some people's flesh off their backs. So I'm like, oh Allah, forgive me for doing those things that I did. Will that also be a means of repentance for the other things I did? Yes. Manjilan la surat. So what he's getting at here is like hope for people. Because a lot of times we're not aware of the things we're doing. We're not aware of the difference that we're looking at on that wall. That comes with time. So at that time, when I become aware, then I can repent. And then as we finish, he says, for the sake of Allah alone. So it's not to gain something like, wow, I'm so pious. Look at me. MashaAllah, I've repented. And that's why I think it's my, you know, people can do what they want. I don't think people need to jump on Instagram sharing their total stories. That's not what that's for. Right? That's between you and Allah. Right? There may be a time for that. There could be a place for that. It's part of instruction. But in the very beginning, even conversion, right? Because sometimes we give converts a lot of latitude that they're not ready for yet. And then they get way, way out there. And then people start to give them a hard time because they're not fully developed. So they may do things that like, it's not allowed still. Or like, oh, you're just giving a lecture in my mosque and now I saw you, you know, with double apple mint. Like, ah, uh, you know, I still have challenges. No, 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 not anymore. You give it talks to the masjid, bro. You gotta be, <laughs> you gotta be perfect. But they haven't ripened naturally. That's why I like to tell, like, honestly, people like, and just just grow, man. Just grow like that. Just develop, you know? Just just grow, find meaning, make some good Muslim friends, you know, develop organic relationships. And then that will naturally come out how this happened, how you became who you were, how Allah guided you. So ta'zim and lillah is that you know my repentance is for God, man. And that's why I tell people all the time, I got a lot of trouble for this. Blew up my phone. If you're, you know, trying to get married, no one has a right to ask you about your past. That's not their business. And sometimes we go, oh, I feel so bad, you know, because I stole the Nahari and we're getting married next week. And I just feel like I have to tell her, you know, I have to tell her like, you know, Habib T. Jalal Qalbi, one time saraqta Nahari min al-Mat'am. And, you know, I don't know what happened. And then I'm like, don't tell her, man, don't tell her. And then, a week later, he's like, man, she cut off the marriage, man, because I stole the Naharis. <laughs> Why did you tell her? That ain't her business or vice versa, unless it's an issue that can harm the marriage. It's a financial issue that can harm you. It's a physical issue like an illness or some kind of mental health situation or some kind of serious legal issue. Yes. But stealing the Nahari from the local restaurant? Come on, man. The Prophet said, everyone's forgiven except those who expose mujahareen, those who expose. They said, who are those who expose? He said, those who tell the sins to people that Allah hid. Because the tawbah is for Allah. Now, if you bring in something into a relationship that may impact 
that relationship like porn addiction or something like that. You better talk about that stuff before you get into marriage because it will destroy your marriage or gambling issues or substance abuse. Yeah, that's a different issue. But stealing the Nahari or, you know, Mrs. Salat or whatever, you know, not, not having a, a good family upbringing or being around the right people, that's not anybody. You had a girl, that ain't nobody's business. Hadamasatarullah. You had a boyfriend, Hadamasatarullah. Because we know that boyfriends for girls is crucifixion. Girlfriends for boys is like, ah, he was just sowing his oats, mashallah, no problem. You know, he was just being a chef, mashallah. But for the girl, right? But the issue is, and it's not allowed for people to ask. And then one person contacted me, this brother, he's like, man, she wants to know my, she wants to read my diaries, dude. <laughs> I was like, tell her she's marrying you for who you're going to be, not for what you were. Nobody trying to marry you when you were 12? You're playing Minecraft? Right? It's not their business. So you have to be careful with this stuff. So he says, That's between you and Allah. You don't find a Sahaba lamenting their past. You don't find them talking about their past. They don't share their past. They were focused on who they were and what they were becoming. And if there were important things, again, let me balance it, that needed to be shared, they were shared. Yes, go ahead. How do you know what's important to share, what's not important to share? What do you have? Premarital counseling. Very important. Right? And again, like I said, if it's going to impact the mental, mental health issues, physical health issues, any type of legal issues, chronic diseases, um, issues like anger management, anger problems, things like that. Those are things that need to be talked about. Anything that can harm the person right, explicitly, those are things that need to be talked about. But I encourage, like, I don't do marriages unless you've seen a marriage counselor, man. I ain't about that life. Uh, as we finish quickly, he says, now we're going to explain this again next week in more detail, right? Making sure that this, this renunciation and this return is for Allah and also fearing his punishment. So, uh, I don't want to be punished. 